My name is Vitaly Sitch, and I'm chief editor at Nova Vremya Media House, which includes a weekly magazine, a news site, a talk radio, and speaking panels. Uh, I'll start in English, then I'll switch uh, to Russian. So this is a very important year for Ukraine, as we have uh, both presidential and parliamentary elections coming. Uh, as a result, the country may change dramatically, or at least substantially. So we'd like today to talk about the uh, chances of each candidate, the possible outcome of the elections, and the implications that they may have on Ukraine and its economy. And discussing all that, we will be with the people who know this matter best. Uh, it's Ukraine's uh, most respected political analyst. And here I'll switch to Russian and, and introduce our guests. Uh, uh, in to my left, in uh, Volosevich, in uh, is deputy director of InfoSapiens. Uh, Irina Pikeshkina, probably the most renowned sociologist uh, in Ukraine, the director of Democratic Initiatives Foundation, the director for Applied Political S uh, Studies, uh, Rostislav Pavlenko, and my um, old friend, Alexei Rabchenko, the only uh, parliament member here from Timoshenko party. And Vladimir Fasenko will also join us. He's a bit stuck in the congestion. So we'll start with Ina. Ina has a about 10 minute presentation and about, uh, about the uh, views of the Ukrainian people their, their um, uh, favorites and their priorities in the election. We'll talk about all the candidates. Good uh, morning, everyone. We will, uh, I will present the results of our uh, survey that was done by three companies, InfoSapiens, Rating Social Group, and Social Monitoring. And I think few of us have heard about our company, about our name, InfoSampiens. We have been we have been um, launched uh, a few only two months ago. I've been working at JFK in the Department of Sociopolitical Research in autumn last year. The business of sociopolitical studies were, was uh, sold to Ipsos, and that's why we started our own company, and we have our own publication of our data. Uh, so, uh, the sampling was 10,000 respondents of these three companies. We've been connect conducting this from the 19th to 13th of January. This is a representative sample of all oblasts uh, except for occupied territories. We asked a traditional question whether you think uh, the things are moving in the right direction in your town, in your oblast, and in, in the country in general. Unfortunately, the majority of the answers are negative, but traditionally, uh, <coughs> in uh, people are more positive about the situation in their town than the country at large. And we have seen this positive trend for several years now, where the positive um, responses in the town for the towns is growing. Uh, for example, in the amalgamated communities in particular, meaning that the reform of decentralization out of all reform is uh, the most welcomed by people. Speaking about the dynamics of this uh, question, the your assessment of the uh, condition in the country from 78 to 73 is the negative answer a little bit decreased and the positive answer uh, has increased a little bit but only to uh, from 12 to 15 percent this may have to do with the election campaign so ukrainians have very positive uh, expectations from the elections, we will see this on the next slide, and the fact that uh, we received Thomas. So the majority of the people are very positive about this event, so this is why there are more positive uh, answers. So how will 
your, the level of your optimism change after elections, uh, the political situation, economic situation, we can see that compared to December, there is a big um, increase of positive expectations that speaks about the mobilization of the constituency. And uh, these upcoming elections, I think, are the most unpredictable in the history of Ukraine. In December, we had only eight candidates who could have passed into the second round, and the difference between them was very little. In January, and at the same time, the leading candidate, Yuri Tomoshenko, in December was getting more than 12 percent, which was very little. Uh, compared to all other previous elections, the leading candidate would have 20, 25 percent, but not 12, as it is now, as it was in December. So this low level of trust to existing politicians uh, has built this demand for new faces in the politics. And in January, Volodymyr Zelensky announced that he will run. And Svetoslav Vokorchuk said that he will not run. And Volodymyr Zelensky, as a result of this, collected all of these potential uh, ranking of the both of them and uh, became a leading candidate. And uh, we will. I've looked at this slide also before our meeting. I was impressed that Ukrainians are very positive about what will happen after elections. Usually Ukrainians are negative about our outcomes. And here there are three or four times more people that are more optimistic about the outcomes of, of elections. Why do you think it is so? Well, that's what is happening before the election. Because of the Zelensky? Well, that's Zelensky factor as well, because people are really are expecting something positive from him. But this is true. But So they've all understood it's going to be funny. And then uh, uh, people in three months after elections in their ranking, they the ranking goes down after elections. People become disillusioned very quickly. So they become charmed very easily and then disillusioned very quickly. So what, uh, apart from Volodymyr Zelensky r ranking, what I w was impressed most of all is the question of what threats are the most relevant for Ukraine right now. And we didn't uh, uh, put this option as massive immigration of people abroad. And it, it, it turned out that that was the biggest threat for, for most people. And then economic downfall and all other economic negative factors ranked second and third. And a full-fledged Russia, only one third of Ukrainians opted for, for that as the biggest threat. So I think the communication about massive immigration of Ukrainians abroad uh, is either very manipulative or exaggerated because in itself it's not a threat. It's uh, the uh, a mitigation measure. But all the... Uh, a survey says that most of the labor migrants are coming back. They're coming back with money. They're investing this in economy. Our employers started became more active, and they're paying more attention to the searching motivation. So I think this is not their biggest threat. But uh, Ukrainians are more afraid that uh, everyone will leave the country rather than some other economic threats or war uh, threat. So there is an interesting breakdown in terms of uh, regions. In all regions, the, the, they think that the biggest threat is massive Im immigration, except for the East and Donbass, where a bigger threat is economic downfall and a full-fledged uh, war with Russia. In those regions that are close to the conflict zone, South, East, and Donbass are where we're mentioning this threat more rarely than uh, center, Western region, and Galicia. So three things that they have to choose that we Ukraine is lacking. Peace, stability, and order was the three uh, top-ranked uh, things that we lacked. So Ukraine thinks that peace is something that we lack most of all, and this share of these people grew compared to the previous year. Also, I think that there was an influence of electoral campaign where there were, there were a lot of candidates who were promising us peace, 
but at the same time they're not explaining how they're going to achieve that. And the citizens themselves, they want peace, but they are not uh, ready for some compromises and uh, uh, also to forget about, ab about our territories. They're not ready for that. So the citizens do believe that uh, their favorite candidate may achieve that peace, but for sure they don't know how, to, how this can be done specific ways of how this can be done. Now moving into the questions about the elections, 45% of Ukrainians said that uh, they uh, most probably participate, they, they will participate, and 36 is that most probably they will. There was also big mobilization in 2014 of that same sort, but we remember that only 60% showed up. But uh, Volodymyr Zelensky um, candidacy may uh, mobilize a younger constituency compared to the previous elections. So the rating now, you see the three columns. That's uh, first one from all the population, from the people, second and from those who want to, who want to vote. And um, there is 21 undecided. And the third is a simulation of the elections under condition that those who are not decided that they will come and vote, as well as those who are decided. And uh, then the election outcomes would look at the third option. So uh, first column, 15% from all the population, then Timoshenko 12 and Petroposhenko 10. If we look from at uh, our January, February, Zelensky's renting is, uh, is has an upward trend and Poroshenko has an upward trend. Here you have the comparison of three company companies' rankings and there are just minor changes within the statistical error. In terms of uh, age, Zelensky has a very young constituency and young voters and uh, his uh, competitors think that most of the young people will not go to 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 go and vote. Yulia Tymoshenko has the oldest uh, const constituency of voters, and Poroshenko is equally spread, uh, um, uh, again, except for youth, where uh, he has a lower ranking. And also parliamentary uh, ranking. Well, here you can see at the third column to. And, and just you can guess which parties overcome the 5% barrier. But Kyushina, Slugan Narodo, Zelensky, President's Bloc, opposition platform, uh, citizen position, radical party, Samopom, which also has, in, uh, has some chances, Nashi and uh, opposition Bloc, and uh, Svoboda and Ukrop. We didn't include Svetoslava Karchuk party because they haven't been established yet. But according to some of the surveys, if established, Vakarachuk party could also has uh, has a chance of uh, getting over 5% barrier. Thank you for your attention. You know, thank you very much for your presentation. Let's talk now about presidential elections and uh, just uh, put it in, in the context. We have three, uh, li uh, three people, uh, the contestants who can win. Uh, Zelensky, Tymoshenko, and Poroshenko number three. Tell me, can any of the remaining candidates interfere with this uh, fight of the three? Uh, realistically, are there any chances? Well, there are always chances for this, but I think this is very unlikely. Maybe some of them may just stay put down their, um, will leave the, the campaign. But three possible Leaders, I think, have been defined, and, and it's uh, very unlikely someone else will go into the second row. I heard that Anatoly Grishenko and uh, Andriy Sadovy may emerge. Even that alliance, you think, will not uh, put it into competition. If, and if mathematically you add their ranking, they still are behind the uh, three um, leading candidates. Well, you can't do it arithmetically because if the one of the candidates, even if he says to vote for the other, not all of them will follow and listen to what he says. So if it hadn't been for Vladimir Zelensky, Anatoly Koryshenko had a big chance of of getting into the second round. They have quite uh, a, a lot of uh, the same voters, overlapping voting constituency. 
for whom the main feature of the candidate is that that it, they are not corrupt, they, are, they should be honest, and uh, despite uh, the high inter, in, internet coverage, the opinion of the public very much depends on, on television, and Volodymyr Zelensky is the king of television. So as soon as he said that he was going to run, um, he, he did draw a, a big share of uh, constituency of voters on himself. Yes, one plus one channel um, broadcasts him 24-7, so that's, that's true. Please, if someone has any alternative opinion, please, you can add. Well, I generally agree. So we decided that we have three main candidates and the contenders for the second round. And if you look at uh, the percentage uh, of 1%, 15% roughly, and the 10% for Poroshenko for the third one, can you say that Zelensky 100% will go into the second round if nothing apocalyptic happens? Because quite a gap, quite a big gap for for, for for one and a half months. Of course, he will be attacked by all candidates, and uh, Poroshenko and Timoshenko are both interested to to be with each other in the second round, not with Zelensky. And then the youth factor. Well, will the young people come to vote? Uh, so there's always there was a, a st constant decrease of. Uh, voting activity of the young uh, generation, and that's a big intrigue. But uh, Ukraine is quite a conservative society, so the older generation, the people, they it, it's not that they were, are negative to Zelensky. They, he's a very low anti-rating, or mm, but he they're afraid that there's, he doesn't have experience. You don't know what to expect, and the uh, candidacy of uh, Zelensky may motivate uh, also the uh, voters of other countries just to come and vote not to have Zelensky so I can't uh, I can't really predict that's a big intrigue so I want to say something why well, disagree with that focus a little bit well first of all a little bit of insight I think in a few days we'll find out about the new uh, surveys and the trend for Zelensky is growing he already becomes the only leader and the big gap so with a big probability he goes to the second round, most probably. I agree with that. Even if, even if the majority of his constituency don't come to the elections, and I totally agree that, uh, the, well, we have to add that not everyone knows that he has a uh, majority of his uh, supporters under 30 that not usually go to vote as, you, uh, as much as uh, the senior population. And yes, there are a lot of politically oriented people who are um, uh, protest minded and uh, these two groups may not show up uh, for the elections but if there is a gap that we have until the March 31st he has a very big chance of uh, getting into the second round and that drastically changes the disposition of the elections now in terms of the second round I can tell you that well it's clear that in the first round no one will win I would give less than 1% of probability that uh, someone can win in the first round. But it's important to why well, I don't agree with fellow colleague. Would you just look at what's happening in the recent days? Uh, we see the anti Poroshenko coalition. Yeah, uh, Lashko joined, the five candidates joined the coalition. Three of them are in the runner up uh, Timoshenko, Grushenko, Sadovoy so joined the coalition. So Lashko is part of them. And Boriko's. Uh, voters, the constituency that used to support the party of Eurigen of Yanukovych, and now they will be voting in the first round for a Boyko, Murayev, and Vilkul. Uh, absolutely, majority of these people will not vote for Poroshenko for clear reasons, because now the campaign of Poroshenko, you can say that it will be not to Poroshenko's favor in the f next one and a half months. The paradox of Poroshenko's election campaign is very powerful. He has very powerful momentum and dynamics, and it reminds me of Kuchma campaign 1999. But the threat is that it gives an advantage to Poroshenko in a way that such a campaign can really take him to the second round. There are big chances for this. However, in the second round, that makes him one against everyone else. So all opposition will join against him, 
and there will a negative factor that will that will uh, play against uh, Timoshenko denial uh, an acceptance of Timoshenko by American constituents and uh, uh, and just for conjecture reasoning they will all support Zelensky thinking that if Zelensky will become the president he will he will be on the on their side if I understand you correctly, Zelensky has very high chances to go to the second rating. Then uh, we would hardly see the option of Timoshenko versus Poroshenko. Yeah, I would not really cast her off the uh, slates. Uh, there was some kind of stagnation in, rating da in her rating dynamics in January, but she has a rather sustainable um, body of voters and their discipline and those are people 50 plus uh, rural residents of uh, the small towns small town ukraine in addition to that the sociologists may not uh, quite catch up with all of the of her rate of her voters uh, so she's in the top three leaders yeah maidan revolution there were three clear favorites klitschko yatsenyuk poroshenko was not even there well, Tjahnebog has never been a favorite of the presidential race. Uh, potentially, Klitschko and at some point Yatsenyuk were favorites, but Maidan has uh, kind of um, burned them during Maidan. They have shown their weakness during Maidan. And uh, in 2014, Poroshenko came uh, about, and similarly here, Zelensky came about this year. We have to be prepared that whoever wins the elections, it's going to be the president of the minority. The decisive part will not uh, be played by presidential but by parliamentary elections. And it will be quite probable that the new government may be opposing the uh, new president. And the Ukrainian version of Trumpism is going to win, unfortunately. Uh, Ukraine, above all, in this patriotic um, tune in uh, Timoshenko is going to be a social version of Trumpism and in Zelensky it's going to be uh, an alien versus the system kind of Trumpism, populistic version of Trumpism. Yeah, you've given us basically everything we wanted to discuss during the uh, whole discussion. In the second year, in the second tour, who's going to, well, who's preferential? Zelensky versus Poroshenko, Timoshenko versus Zelensky, or Timoshenko versus Poroshenko. Well, I can say that Zelensky is winning with a lot of uh, opportunities and um, with high rates, and still I would not see this as a tough um, dominance. He still has very high chances and high uncertainty, high level of uncertainty. As to Poroshenko, Timoshenko, yes, she may win, but the gap is not going to be that large. Similarly, the indecision is quite high. Irina, may I ask you about Zelensky's phenomenon? How ha, how does it work that the person without any party infrastructure in the regions, a comic, has taken on the first uh, place in the presidential race? Well, it's very easy to explain. It's a separate conversation about the political crisis in Ukraine, about how the politicians are seen, and as well as all political parties, as well as uh, all parties. People are very negativistic to all political parties, to all politicians, against all politicians, and uh, the conceptions of our uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, and the mind of our Ukrainian citizens, uh, Ukraine is always moving in the wrong direction. And when we asked in summer whether or not the country needs new political leaders, 62%, if I remember correctly, said, yes, we need them. And whether or not they see that only 25% of them saw them. And when we openly said, who do you see as new political leaders? It was an open question and people had to answer for themselves. That was Zelensky, that was Vakarchuk, and that was, by the way, Muraev. 
So 5% have given us uh, the names of the first two and 3% of Muraev. How can people know, uh, get to know other political leaders from TV? Where else can the vast majority of people know them, get to know them? So the phenomenon of Zelensky is quite clear. So we have three or four oligarchs controlling six key TV channels. So they are basically controlling access to voters by 70%, by 75. Let's remember Rabinovich phenomenon. Nobody knew about him. Then he started appearing on TV and he immediately got a presidential rating. The TV can promote anyone or at least give very high opportunities, particularly that Zelensky is quite artistic. He says what people want to hear. He support. He insists that he's not a politician. He says that the main thing is uh, to have a good and decent person as a president, and many people like that. And whom did he mobilize? If we remember our summer poll, Well, a lot of young people did not uh, plan to go in elections. And there was uh, this other candidate option in the list, and this other candidate was taken 15%. Now there is an other candidate as well, and he gets 2%. So when Zelensky came in, um, the number of young people has halved of those who don't want to go to vote. They don't want to offer to vote for existing politicians, the young people. So basically, it's just a protest intention <clears throat> against the candidates. Well, even Zelensky is good enough as long as it's not you guys, is what they say, say with this choice. So we need to have a very clear conversation of who are our current politicians. As to the forecast, I will not give the forecast since I don't know. Lately, I've been invited to breakfasts and lunches and dinners all the time, and I do not satisfy people because I cannot tell them who's going to be the winner. Until recently, I would have said that Zelensky was not going to be in the second round, and now I can say I have my doubts because actually his rating is growing, but the electoral campaign, a rational electoral campaign, hasn't even started yet, so we'll see what happens. The phenomenon of youth, 2012, Klitschko, Udar, Petkivshina, they had the same rating. But I immediately said that those are different ratings because Petkivshina had the voters of older generation and Udar had young people. As a result, Udar has got a lot less because um, they than what they were promised. And it's not only about uh, the uh, young people living wanting or not wanting to go to vote. Let's remember that the young people don't usually live at their registration place. Well, they have to travel home, they have to uh, take an absentee voting um, sheet or they have to go back home. I would say that Zelensky wouldn't be in the second round, but there's one but. He, he sort of jumped out into the arena because uh, it's a performance. He used to have eight points and now he has uh, 16. He did the um, New Year welcoming speech instead of a president. His presentations are usually very good. I would say he has genius political technologists. Maybe his electoral campaign will become once part of the textbooks as a very successful one. And just before elections, uh, they may possibly issue the new issues of the uh, servant of the people or other videos or other uh, shows and quite possibly they could uh, organize something emotional for the young people if they do decide to go and vote uh, at their place of registration they would organize buses for you so something so it's possible that they might go and vote for him 
But I think in the second round, reason will prevail, I hope, whoever is with. Okay, uh, Zelensky hardly meets with the press. He doesn't give interviews. Um, of all the public conversations, he's only spoken to, well, that's what I'm saying. On the rational level, I'll try to ask you this. Many people are saying Yulia Tymoshenko is a populist. Do you think that he's an even bigger populist when he says that the president just wants to be decent, has to be decent and will put everyone to jail? In a well-developed well democracy, as you know, wherever there are adversarial elections, the uh, more populism there is. The poorer the country, the higher the populism. And at these elections, the populism is going to be going through the roof. Some are promising to reduce tariffs by a factor of two, others by a factor of four. Others are saying that uh, uh, minimal salary has to be $1,000 and minimal pension has to be $1,000. So populism is going through the roof. So it's important to introduce some rational element into the electoral um, campaign. And the reason I want to have lunches and business lunches and dinners and whatnot, and I want to know what's going to happen next, is that our electoral campaign is not only about who's going to be the winner, but what really those winners are going to do. What are they going to make happen? Because at least two real candidates, well, it's not clear what they're going to be actually doing if and when they win. Okay, these are your 10th or 20th elections. No, not that far. I hope to live to see the day. Okay. Uh, we were discussing this before this panel. How are they different from all the previous elections? Well, first, they're unpredictable and uncertain. This has been said already. Secondly, very low proportion of ratings of leaders from the whole population, if we take the un not the undecided, but the actual leaders. Sort of negativistic and um, the political crisis. What's positive about this? Well, yeah, we have acute political competition, and that's a good thing. The leader of the race is changing every day. Yeah, we have a lot of democracy here, that's true. The positive thing is that whoever wins, our foreign policy is not going to change. Because of all the candidates, only one is obviously pro-Russian, and that's Boyko. And they keep maintaining this policy to get the highest results to select the 20% of Russian-speaking citizens to have good faction, to consolidate a good faction for the parliamentary elections. That's quite clear. But they're not going to dominate. They're not going to be a majority. The parliamentary vote for EU and NATO, yeah, it's very easy. So whoever wins, I don't think foreign policy is going to change much. So I think our European partners our partners from the uh, U.S., from other democratic states, are going to have influence on the future policy. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Volodymyr Fesenko, tell us, please. We've seen the four years of work of Petro Poroshenko. I think his trajectory of actions, if he's going to get re-elected uh, for the second term, we can sort of um, forecast what he's going to do. Uh, it's not easy for me, however, to forecast what Timoshenko is going to do. Uh, I've been in journalism for 20 years, um, or 30 years. I've been vote. I've interviewed her three times. But who's going to, who's scaring you more? Her as a president or Zelensky as a president? Well, I am afraid of the crisis as a result of electoral campaign. Increasing aggression tough resistance against oppositional candidates on practically all of them, and this provoking of aggressive moods among the voters, using various radical groups for resistance, and uh, the stake at winning at any cost. This is what I'm most concerned about and what I'm most afraid of. As to the 
winning of a free candidate. Well, how is going to Ukraine change if Zelensky comes, becomes president, if Tymoshenko becomes president? Well, as far as Zelensky is concerned, it's terra incognita. I agree with Irina that uh, in the foreign policy, there's not going to be any major changes. The pro-Western foreign policy uh, trend is going to prevail. But we cannot give anything specific on Zelensky. Even if Zelensky wants this sincerely, I don't think he's going to uh, explain who's what's his policy on Donbass going to be or how he's going to take uh, the country uh, to the European Union and what his NATO policy is going to be. De jure or de facto, uh, when Zelensky becomes president, the country will become, uh, will start transforming into parliamentary republic, either through uh, constitutional changes to safeguard against unpredictable president, or de facto, the center of decision making, particularly after the parliamentary elections, will move to the parliament. To continue the Zelensky topic, uh, how independent is or rather, how dependent Vladimir Zelensky is uh, from uh, billionaire Igor Kolomoisky. The key person, the key decision maker is basically de facto Kolomoisky. Well, his influence is going to grow significantly. There's some influence uh, going on through his, uh, well, the center of decision making will move to Geneva. Well, there are different versions there. When people are saying that Zelensky is a marionette of uh, Kolomoisky, there's a kind of simplification there. Here's a counter argument. There's another famous Ukrainian oligarch, Viktor Pinchuk. So please note, Zelensky's ads over the past months is actively promoted on Pinchuk's channels. As far as I know, Zelensky has very good personal relations with Pinchuk. And I think many people in this room know full well how conflicting are the relations between Pinchuk and Kolomoisky. So I believe that uh, multiple sides, multiple parties are going to influence Zelensky. At first, uh, Kolomoisky may influence him more, but the vast majority of the Ukrainian political scene and business uh, will be interested to make sure that uh, relative monopoly of Poroshenko should not be replaced with relative monopoly of Kolomoisky, because Kolomoisky may be even more scary. There may be a trend towards coalition government with a new coalition without the domination of one oligarch. I interpret it slightly differently. Pinchuk is usually diversifying his portfolio. Well, I don't think he will start advertising a primitive, a direct marionette of his direct competitor. Well, another question that I'm concerned about, maybe you'd um, uh, help me answer it. Do you think that modernization rates will start, will speed up after those two elections? No, I think, uh, I don't think so. I think modernization may speed up only if the new government is saturated with strong, driven reformers. If we have such people in the new government after the parliamentary elections, then we stand a chance. So I met with Ukrainian businessman not so long ago. He says, your investors and representatives of the Ukrainian business and international business that's cooperating with Ukraine, here's some advice. Do not wait until the result of presidential elections. Look for people who can continue uh, and uh, make the reforms more effective uh, in the new government. Look for the new driven prime minister, and uh, that's what we should bet on. Have you heard the candidates of, for, the pres, for the prime minister? Well, I think Groisman will stay in uh, um, as a prime minister and at least until presidential elections, even if uh, Zelensky wins uh, to continue, to ensure continuity. But who's going to be the president after October elections, starting from December? Then there's no answer there. The answers can be very different. Uh, one of the options is, uh, well, with Zelensky, Tymoshenko may become. Uh, a prime minister, but with a coalition government. And it depends who's going to be in the coalition and what the balance of power is going to be. 
We will move to Alexei Ryabchin. In the U.S., they have an unusual president there as well, but they have a system of checks and balances. Is there another, is there a system of checks and balances in Ukraine? And can the media, NGOs, civil society, and our Western partners be part of such system? Or um, tradition? is it a traditional reminder? Uh, is the only reminder to Ukrainian politicians that they are doing something wrong is people's revolution? Well, people's revolution is an extreme element uh, of uh, checks and balances uh, when there's no more way left to go. Uh, there is a very specific Ukrainian system of checks and balances, but it is, well, I would say formally or even more so, in, it's, it's rather informal. In the past years, one of the key elements is our international partners. At the IMF, in the Ukrainian politics, institutionally speaking, that's the European Union. But let me note one thing. A certain system of checks and balances exists and the balance of, in the balance of interests of different oligarchs, and it's there. And I think it will continue being in place after the presidential elections. But one counterbalance that was displayed during the electoral campaign and will continue during the, um, uh, the electoral campaign further, uh, and that's the Minister of Interior, Mr. Avakov. And so he has put some distance, I think, between the current uh, uh, candidates. He wants to maintain balance during the uh, in the interim period, particularly after elections, and he has distanced himself somewhat uh, away from the uh, from Tymoshenko. Alexey Ryabtsev, um, um, how did it happen that the person who has uh, finished the ministerial program in Sussex University um, works for Yulia Tymoshenko. What attracted you in the poli in a politician whom everyone believes, many people uh, believe a politician? Sorry, I prepared uh, in uh, English, but uh, I'll switch to the dictatorship of the majority. Only 10% are listening and wearing headphones. Okay, so for 30 seconds, I'll try to pass what uh, Madame Tymoshenko asked me to pass on to you. She is sorry she do, she can't be here. We have looked at the names of companies and investors. Basically, we've met with all of you. We have even said and uh, joked that about 10% uh, of companies uh, that are owning 50 to 60% of the Ukrainian debt have been met. All the myths have been ruined. Uh, the, uh, the remaining companies that are present here, um, uh, we want to tell you that we want to, we, we shall be paying debts. We shall be covering our debts, even where the arrangements were not very good. Um, um, we will still pay our debts. Uh, we will continue working with the IMF. I don't know if the representative is still here, but we'll be prepared to long nights negotiations. We know how to do that. Pro NATO, pro European course will stay. And the key thing for Yulia Tymoshenko to, is to implement the uh, program course uh developed by presence by the by the experts uh, it's domestic investments and external investments so investors are of key importance to us in answer to your question let's uh, let me remind you that the current president was also elected on populistic Remarks: a Dollar for eight, uh, war within one, uh, finished within one week, and so on. So it's not just one politician who is uh, riding the populistic horse. But sometimes, Mr. Mashenko does have populistic rhetoric. But half we have 20 MPs. Half of the faction are young MPs who just came into the parliament after Maidan, and half are experienced. So uh, Yulia Tymoshenko sometimes ten takes on this populistic rhetorics, and we have the chance to go into deep reforms. Uh, energy conservation, where I have a lot of uh, achievements, promotion of electric cars, um, climatic championship of Ukraine, and with the help of the, the government and president, we have adopted Paris Climate Agreement, uh, and we were second in the world. So I'm grateful to her that I am one of the 
sort of most active um, uh, MPs in the parliament. 25% of draft laws are come from me. Um, the civil service, agricultural network reform, all of that. Let me assure you that in Kiev, you feel like a super reformer in the Hyatt and the Fermont Hotel and the conferences on energy, whatnot. You feel like a pure reformer with a PhD. Um, I wanted to, I had to be in Vinitsa, but I'm here today, so I'll go there tomorrow. When you leave Kyiv, when you talk to people, you don't become a populist. You become a very uh, angry realist when you actually meet the people and uh, face their questions. When we're talking about uh, renewable energy, uh, and for people, uh, renewable energy is uh, cutting off their gas supplies and uh, cutting the trees to heat their houses. Uh, and pure research said that the ch climate change is uh, uh, the biggest global threat. Now, that's his personal problem, and uh, I do not support Donald Trump there. I know how important it is, uh, how it is uh, related to sustainable development, and I recommend that you reread the new course. Those of you who didn't have the time to read uh, for 400 pages, uh, we will make an abridged version. We have a very good section on sustainable development, renewable energy, and I'm proud to be able to uh, influence that. If you don't mind, let's talk about economic interests of Yulia Tymoshenko. I recently wrote a post on Facebook about that, um, and there was quite a lot of attention to it. Uh, Timoshenko's achievements, I wrote, uh, was breaking down the, the corruption schemes in late 90s in energy, uh, reprivatization of uh, Krivorish Stal. Uh, two Ukrainian oligarchs uh, did 800 million um, with a big discount, and she resold it to ArcelorMittal for 5 billion. So she has demonstrated herself as a fighter against corruption, but as um, a prime minister, she was trying to uh, interfere in the basic things and the cost effectiveness of uh, supermarkets, of petrol stations, and we had shortages of basic products. She was criticizing banking uh, system, which many people abroad believe that this is uh, an exemplary system. Uh, the sale of land, uh, she thinks it's not good and be, international partners think it's good. Is she changing? Well, in order to say whether she's changing or not, you have to be as long as in journalism as you. What I've seen in communication, when we're sitting at the headquarters, I can see her reflecting on these actions that she used to do when uh, President Yushchenko was in, in power and uh, she was prime minister. And she's reflecting back, and I've seen that she's done the work on her mistakes. She learned from her mistakes during her prison time. And we in the team are learning what needs to be done and what shouldn't be done. And it's important to have both um, experienced and unexperienced politicians. And she sees this as a mission, as a person who has a burden of responsibility. And she is apologizing for her previous mistakes at her Congress. And what Mr. Fesenko said, bringing in the team of young people, um, not just generally, many people from EBRD, from London, from New York, came back here and went to civil society. But they started uh, getting some uh, corrupt orders, and nobody has, uh, you know, to come to their defense, and they just resigned and left the country. So it's important that the strength for the faith in institutions, faith in the country could be there. That is why I'm with her. But whether or not she has changed, well, I think we can judge that after the elections. I believe in that. Last short question before we switch to just up. You are an economist, among others. What kind of changes are you expecting from Timoshenko once she, if she becomes a president? What all of us should expect? Well, briefly, well, this election campaign, just to refocus on what we said, will be either people will show up for the voting and they will vote either for the changes or for this fragile status quo that we have. I'm talking to different people, but what I know for sure is that 
this will be energy independence and that will continue there will there will be a lot of investors who will come to gas generation who will become energy independent because having so much gas and not doing anything with this that's um, that's wrong a lot of things will be done in energy efficiency metering because we have big uh, corruption in energy sector, no metering and the, the, um, a lot of things re re related to renewable uh, so energy, law enforcement and secret service will not be uh, providing the roof or, or special services or protection uh, for uh, business. There will be a land market with following the European rules we and the parliament can't do it so we have to have a dictatorship of farmers rather than anything else. this just so uh, there are two and a half million well, farmers in poland and i think this is the last time we voted for extending the moratorium we have to instead vote for the laws that would regulate that market and i think we'll have a lot of good things and we'll just to highlight uh, to everyone that you can look at the changes that Timoshenko is proposing in terms of new constitution. This is not just a campaign slogan. It doesn't bring any bonuses in terms of election. But she is very serious about this. She understands that without changing the system, without putting together the new co constitution and uh, rebooting the country, uh, anyone will then come like uh, Zelensky without changing the system, without uh, uh, the constitution that will be enforced. Nothing will, will happen. No, there will be no change. And in terms of economy, a everything is going to be much better if the machine is in place than it is now because we will have internal investors. And people will not be in such a disparity in poverty when poor become poor and, and wealthy become more wealthy. That will be liquidated. Thank you. The former deputy head uh, of presidential administration, the head of the Institute for uh, uh, Policy Research. I understand you don't represent the president, but you know him better than many others. I think that Petro Poroshenko has uh, a lot of achievements in terms of his uh, uh, presidency, decentralization, visa-free re regime, independence of church, but there are also some of the failures um, and shortcomings. I will tell you what journalists are talking about. Uh, the lack of fighting uh, the, uh, with corruption. None of the top officials, including Yanukovych people, were not imprisoned over the last uh, five years, the slow progress in the judicial reform, Ukrainian courts are not performing in their function. The schemes of uh, squeezing the finance of uh, money from the state-owned enterprises that the president sh cannot be aware of. So what are the chances that we will see progress in those areas if the Poroshenko is president again? Well, over the five years, we have had to do things that haven't been done for decades. and. Just having a leapfrog from feudal uh, epoch to the developed uh, modern country was deemed impossible. So that is why we are talking now about populism as something unrealistic and uh, unsupported uh, promises, and the cha and the changes have to be based on the foundation that was laid over the have been laid over the last five years. So in terms of fighting the corruptions, the bodies were established that are independent from the president for the parliament to fight with that corruption. Uh, similarly, we can talk about judiciary uh, along the same lines. Uh, that We are completing the establishment of the institutions that may change the situation. We can look at the experience of other countries. Um, nowhere of the last five years anything similar has been done. We know that in order to launch the reform that you have to spend some time. And we were talking about the joint efforts of the president and the cabinet of ministers and the reformers of the, in the parliament to make sure that these uh, decisions are passed because we were, uh, we were to break many things uh, that were resisting that process. So now we have a situation where we have the foundation that is laid and we have to build on it. When the president was talking about the priorities that uh, for future and uh, the uh, possibilities for investments, 
which includes finalization of the judicial reform, equal playing field for business, and uh, reform of the law enforcement, stripping them from unnatural functions in the economic sector to um, establish an analytical um, institution, the Bureau for Financial Security, that will not be using law enforcement methods, but instead analyzing the fiscal sector could uh, ask from different enterprises and not push them to to do something but to start the dialogue on how to correct the situation for better. And uh, these draft laws were sent to the parliament and in many ways the parliament already decided on many of them and uh, where we're st which those that are still in the pipeline, it's just enough to, to uh, speed up, finish the processing and have them voted on. So overcoming corruption and equal playing field for all investors is part of the national security issue and that's the issue of good governance. And open tapping on the p capacity and potential that Ukraine has, but just closing your eyes and doing this and thinking that things that have been done over the decades can be done overnight, that's not true. The five years that we have had were aimed at uh, laying the foundation in order to answer these questions in future. Do you think the president wants to have the rule of law in Ukraine, something that all investors are concerned with? By all means. As I said, without, I'm answering the question, without rule of law, uh, we can't imagine any uh, regional leader, um, Ukraine being regional le leader, part of EU, or attracting foreign investments. That's why we were not just talking about things, but doing things um, to put the foundation to make sure that the rule of law will work. Uh, I think. Um, in November, there was a survey which said that among those who had to do with the judiciary, there are two times higher approval ratings than those who were not uh, acquainted or didn't deal with the judiciary. We are, I think, exhausting our time. Rutsenko is already here, I think. So what are the steps that you're expecting from Petro Poroshenko that could speed up the economic development and improve economic climate, investment climate? Well. What he is saying, I think what he mentioned today in the morning, is finalizing this uh, li liberal reforms that uh, would destroy the last barriers. So stripping off the law enforcement of their natural uh, functions and mandates. Anti-corruption court should be launched in spring. The licensing for appeal courts will have to be finished and attestation for all the remainder of the uh, judges. You asked about state-owned enterprises. There are about, th about 3,000 of them that need to be privatized. We already have the foundation, but we have to do it. And land market, we have to ensure that there is uh, there are good conditions to have a civilized market, but that uh, barrier has to be eliminated. So we have to protect the rights of those people who are working on the with the grants. So it has to be transparent market.